Welcome to the History of Witchcraft. Episode 24. Fair is foul, and foul is fair. Give me leave to tell you once again that at my birth, the front of heaven was full of fiery shapes, the goats ran from the mountains, and the herds were strangely clamorous to the frighted fields. These signs have marked me extraordinary, and all the courses of my life do show I am not in the role of common men. Owen Glendower, in Henry IV, Part 1 The regent conquers, and the Frenchmen fly, now help, ye charming spells and periapts, and ye choice spirits that admonish me and give me signs of future accidents. You speedy helpers that are substitutes under the lordly monarch of the north appear and aid me in this enterprise. This speedy and quick appearance argues proof of your accustomed diligence to me. Now ye familiar spirits that are culled out of the powerful regions under earth, help me this once, that France may get the field. Joan of Arc calling upon her demonic allies to protect her in Henry VI, Part 1. I myself have all the other, and the very ports they blow, all the quarters that they know. I, the shipman's card, I will drain him dry as hay. Sleep shall neither night nor day. Hang upon his penthouse lid, he shall live a man forbid. Wary sea knights nine times nine, shall he dwindle peak and pine. Though his bark cannot be lost, yet it shall be tempest tossed. Here I have a pilot's thumb, wrecked as homeward he did come. The Curse of the First Witch in Macbeth Welcome back to the History of Witchcraft podcast. Last time, we took a look at two popular plays from early modern England the Elizabethan Dr. Faustus, authored by Christopher Marlowe, and the Jacobean The Witch, by Thomas Middleton. In both plays, the supernatural is important to the story. In Middleton's piece, Hecate and her coven provide goods and services to the other characters, the nobles and courtiers of the play, for their politicking, seductions, and murders. In Faustus, the supernatural is the story. A bored academic trades his soul for magical powers, only to waste his remaining time on Earth and regret his willing damnation. The audience is horrified and amused in equal measure, as Faustus, alongside his demonic sidekick Mephistopheles, play pranks on the Pope, entertain the nobility, kisses the spirit of Helen of Troy, and loses his mind as the hour of his damnation comes closer. As great as these plays may be, Elizabethan and Jacobean England are often joined together by one phrase, and it isn't Middletonian England, or Molloween England. It is, of course, Shakespearean England, and I can't think of another era named after a literary figure. Perhaps Chaucer, Austen, maybe Byron are enough of a household name to evoke an image of an era of English and British history, but certainly not to the preeminence of Shakespeare. Shakespeare straddled the reigns of Elizabeth and James, and every schoolchild in Britain, and quite possibly elsewhere in the world, can name at least one of his plays. That's probably less because they are big fans of the Bard's work, and more that the syllabus is decided by people who are themselves big fans. Much like Chaucer, we were forced to read and learn about his work because the grown-ups told us it was really good. Like, really good. While The Canterbury Tales is still not on my reading list, and I'm by no means Shakespeare's biggest fan, I do enjoy a bit of Shakespeare every now and then. Not so much reading it, mind you, but you're missing out if you haven't seen a performance by Kenneth Branagh or Brian Blessed. Anyway, if you hadn't guessed from the title and my little tirade just now, today's episode is all about Shakespeare's plays, or at least the ones relevant to the supernatural, and particularly those involving witchcraft. Much like Marlowe and Middleton, we can learn much from the subjects Shakespeare chose to use in his plays, and how they are presented. Today, we're going to look at about a dozen examples of magic and the supernatural in the works of the Bard. 
It is commonly accepted that Shakespeare found much of his inspiration for historical events from the Chronicles of Hollinshead, or Hollinshed, I'm not entirely sure. First published in 1577 and again in 1587, this was a collaborative history, first intended to be a, in the words of the project's founder, Reginald Wolfe, a universal cosmography of the whole world. However, Wolfe found that he could not quite manage to research and write such a vast project on his own, and so employed a number of men to assist. Wolfe would have had the same problem producing a history podcast, it has to be said. Sadly for Wolfe, he died before the project was complete, and those who took over the endeavour reduced the focus to the British Isles instead of the entire world. The man now in charge was Raphael Hollinshead, or Hollinshed. It is believed that it was from Hollinshead that Shakespeare learnt the details he includes in many of his histories, as well as providing the historical basis for Macbeth. Despite this, Shakespeare took quite the artistic licence with his historical works, something shared with modern-day Hollywood, it has to be said, but perhaps most blatantly, he did this with Richard III. Richard III depicts the rise and fall of the eponymous king, Richard, Duke of Gloucester. Shakespeare's depiction of Richard is simply mean, especially considering that it has moulded our perception of the man even further. He is depicted as, quote, deformed, unfinished, and is so hideous, he declares at the beginning of the play, that he is determined to prove a villain, matching the assumptions others make upon seeing his hideous form. He suddenly becomes one, immediately plotting to usurp the throne for himself, and to do so begins by orchestrating the downfall of George, Duke of Clarence, his own elder brother. By bribing a soothsayer to tell the king, Edward, his elder brother, that, quote, G of Edward's heirs the murderer shall be, end quote. In other words, the future usurper and killer of Edward's children had a name that begins with G. The king assumes that this means the Duke of Clarence, whose name is George. In actuality, this fake prophecy turns out to be true, as Richard's title is the Duke of Gloucester. See? Prophecies are fun like that. We'll see more prophecies later on. The king falls for this ruse and imprisons his brother in the Tower of London. Later, Richard sends two men to murder Clarence, who stab him and drown him in a barrel of Malmsey wine. While Shakespeare's telling largely makes Clarence out to be a victim of the manipulating Richard, the real events are somewhat different. In 1477, one of Clarence's retainers, an astrologer named Dr. John Stacy, was accused of foretelling the death of the king. As we've seen many times before, to prophesize or predict the death of the monarch was treason. Unlike our friend Dr. John Dee, who managed to persuade the Court of Star Chamber that he was innocent, and so escaped with his life, Stacy was less fortunate. He was tortured, and admitted to having, quote, imagined and compassed, end quote, the death of the king, and used his black arts to bring this about. In this, he implicated two other men, both close friends of Clarence, and while one managed to escape the gallows through the intervention of the Bishop of Norwich, both Stacy and Thomas Burdett, the other friend, were executed at Tyburn as traitors. Now, Clarence was not pleased about this, and shouted to the world that his friends had been innocent, the victims of a tyrannical king who brought about their deaths through his own witchcraft. And just like that, Clarence was arrested and taken to the tower. He was charged with treason, with Edward himself ordering Parliament to pass a bill of attainder a brutal act which circumvented the need for evidence, legal defence, or anything really resembling a trial. Clarence was condemned to death for, quote, unnatural, loathly treasons, end quote, and was executed in the Tower on the 18th of February, 1478. Whether he was actually drowned in a barrel of wine is unknown, but the rumour clearly spread far enough and deep enough that Shakespeare used it in his own play, forever immortalising the story. When compared with the recorded history, Shakespeare's retelling is like a fan fiction. Clarence loses all of his impetus, a naive innocent murdered by a conniving Richard, when really, he brought it on himself. Another element of Richard III which involves magic is Richard's outburst in the third act, when he claims that his withered arm had been caused by the witchcraft of the Queen and Jane Shaw, a mistress of his late brother Edward, who had died at this point. 
This scene provides him with an excuse to remove the supporters of the Queen from court, but otherwise has no other relevance to the plot. Again, history fills in the gaps. Edward had married his Queen, Elizabeth Woodville, despite her relatively low status. She was, after all, merely the daughter of a duchess, so basically she was a filth-flinging peasant. Rumours swirled that either she or her mother, the Duchess of Bedford, had enchanted the king in order to bring about this unnatural wedding. Formal accusations were levelled during a rebellion in 1469, but the supposed witnesses refused to testify after the rebellion was crushed, and so the case collapsed. This should have been the end of things, but after Edward's death in 1483, Richard revived the rumours and used them to declare Elizabeth and Edward's marriage to be a sham, disinheriting all of their children in one fell swoop, and, oh, would you look at that, it made Richard the rightful heir. That was very convenient indeed. In the first part of Shakespeare's trilogy on the life of Henry VI, the aptly named Henry VI Part I, it begins with the funeral of Henry V, of Once More Unto the Breach and Agincourt fame. Henry Sr. had died a little too early, leaving his one-year-old son to take the throne as Henry VI, although he is aged up substantially in the play. Part one of the trilogy largely deals with the loss of English territory in mainland France, as well as the beginnings of the factionalism, which would lead to the Wars of the Roses. Of interest to us, however, is the treatment of Joan of Arc. In reality, Joan was a peasant woman, who saw what she took to be visions sent from God, instructing her to fight for the future French king's cause. After passing the trials put to her by the king and the clergy to ensure that she was pious and not an agent of the devil, she promised to lift the siege of Orléans. Lo and behold, the siege was lifted. How much of a role Joan actually played is debated, but the French army did enjoy significant success while she was with it and noble commanders admitted to taking her divinely inspired advice. A succession of cities and strongholds fell to the army guided by Joan, and it was her suggestion that led to the smashing of the English army at the Battle of Patay. Joan remained with the army as it captured Paris from the Duke of Burgundy, and sat out a short-lived truce between the English and French by writing angry letters to the Hussites, a heretical sect largely based around Bohemia. When the truce ended, war resumed, and Joan returned to the army before being captured when retreating from a raid. The Burgundians transferred Joan to the custody of the English for the price of 10,000 livres. Bearing in mind this was over a century and a half later, and all that entails, but if you remember back to the trial of the Templars, Philip the Fair's annual debt to the Holy Order was 100,000 livres in 1286. So spending 10,000 livres on a peasant woman is no small purchase, and indeed, according to Remy Amble's Prisoners of War in the Hundred Years' War, depending on the type of livre, this could be as much as £1,600 to £2,100 in contemporary coinage. To put that into perspective, Amble notes that around this period, this was the average ransom for a baron, and far more than knights, although I'm not quite sure Joan would take it as flattery. Once in English hands, Joan's fate was sealed. She was charged with heresy and cross-dressing, among other crimes. Her case would not have been out of place in any 20th century show trial. No evidence could be found to support the heresy charges. Joan was denied a legal advisor, and the tribunal consisted solely of English and Burgundian clergy, with Joan's request for French members denied. Witnesses told of threats to their lives if they did not testify, and Joan was detained in a secular prison guarded by soldiers, instead of an ecclesiastical facility staffed with nuns, as was proper. Despite this, and despite these disadvantages, Joan appears to have very aptly defended herself, sidestepping her prosecutor's theological traps with apparent ease, which is all the more surprising considering that she had no formal training in either law or divinity. When confronted about wearing male clothing, she defended herself by pointing out that both on campaign and now in custody, she was surrounded by soldiers and all the risks that meant. The wearing of men's clothing was not so much an attempt to fit in or deceive, although she did use it for such at times, but more to deter rape. This reasonable response was not enough, and Joan was threatened with execution if she did not agree to give up her male clothes. She had abjured, and so avoided the stake. 
except she hadn't. Less than a week later, her guards took away her legally acceptable clothes, that is, women's clothes, and only left her with the clothes of a soldier. Despite arguing with them and demanding that they be returned, they were implacable, and Joan was forced to wear the forbidden articles, and lo and behold, she'd relapsed. This was the second strike the court needed to condemn Joan to death, and so on the 30th of May, 1431, she was burnt at the stake for heresy. Her story really is remarkable, and I may need to return to Joan's life and death in a dedicated episode, even though it doesn't really fall under the show's remit. For now, though, this should give you a mirror for Shakespeare's depiction of events. In Henry VI, Part 1, Joan of Arc initially appears much as she does historically. She is a peasant woman who plays a role in several English defeats. However, Throughout the play, the characters hurl accusations of witchcraft at Joan, which appear to have been inspired by the recordings of Hollinshed, who hint that the peasant girl's visions and remarkable abilities were due to her practising witchcraft and her relationship with the devil. When Joan and Talbot duel, he declares that he just needs to draw blood for her to lose her powers. Thinking back to the previous episode on English witch beliefs, curses could be cured by cutting the skin of the witch who cast it. By the fifth act, as the French forces suffer defeat, Joan appeals to demons and spirits for assistance, an excerpt of which I read at the start of the episode. In the theory of demonologists, when a witch is about to be, or has already been captured, the devil abandons them to their fate, as they've already damned themselves. So too in Shakespeare. Her appeals for aid go unanswered, and Joan becomes more and more desperate. She offers her spiritual guardians increasing rewards if they assist her. A drink of her blood that she will, quote, lop a member off, provide her body for, quote, recompense, and eventually offers, quote, body, soul, and all, end quote. Despite this begging, her demonic allies abandon her, and she is captured by York. Damsel of France, I think I have you fast. Unchain your spirits now with spelling charms, and try, if they can, to gain your liberty. A goodly prize, fit for the devil's grace. See how the ugly wench doth bend her brows, as if with Circe she would change my shape. We see York here mocking Joan, telling her to try and use her spirits to escape. When she glares at him, he goes on to laugh at her, alluding to her trying to curse him like Circe did with the Argonauts. Later in Act 5, Joan is on trial, and it doesn't start well. She's brought face to face with her father, the shepherd, and when he cries out about seeing his daughter die, she calls him a, quote, decrepit miser and base ignoble wretch, end quote, claiming that he is not her father and she is born of nobler blood. This doesn't go down well with the others present, including the father, who leaves the stage calling for Joan to be burnt, because hanging was too good for her. Isn't that fatherly love? Joan goes on to deny that she had never communed with spirits, and says she is virtuous and holy, and her murder would call down divine punishment due to her holy and vaginal status. It's quite a lengthy monologue, decrying the English for their slaughter of innocence, and bigging up her own virtue. The response from York is essentially, whatever, go kill her. But Warwick, ever the gentleman, orders that instead of the usual wood pyre, that she would be graced with barrels of pitch, which would burn hotter, faster, and kill her quicker, because it's nicer that way. When she hears this, Joan abandons her previous claims of virginity, and declares that she is with child. This isn't a terrible defence. Pregnant women were often spared execution because of the unborn child. But York and Warwick mock this supposedly holy maid, assuming that the child is of the Dauphin, the King of France, and declaring that Joan will go to the stake anyway. So, Joan declares that the father isn't the Dauphin, but is instead the Duke of Alençon. That doesn't work either, since York and Morrick hate Alençon. Joan apologises and reveals that she had lied, the father was neither Charles or Alençon, but instead the King of Naples. Yeah, they're not buying it, claiming that the King being married makes this even worse. Joan is led off stage, cursing York and Warwick, and is burnt. In Henry VI, Part 2, another instance of witchcraft appears on stage. 
on the orders of the Duchess of Gloucester, Marjorie Jourdain, a quote, cunning witch, end quote, and Roger Bolingbroke, a conjurer, summon a spirit called Asmath. Asmath provides them with a number of prophecies detailing the fates of the King, the Duke of Suffolk, and the Duke of Somerset. These three predictions are the extent of the spirit's power, and he is ordered to, quote, descend to darkness and to the burning lake, end quote. In other words, go back to hell. Their answers received, it all goes pear-shaped. Immediately after the exit of Asmath, York and Buckingham enter with their guards and arrest all those in attendance. The Duchess is banished to the Isle of Man, a fate worse than death, while Marjorie Jourdain is burned at Smithfield and Bolingbroke and the other men in attendance are hanged. In this case, we have a blatant use of spirits to divine the deaths of the leading men of the kingdom, and both the crime and punishment would be instantly recognisable to an Elizabethan audience. Not only does this act match the traditional taboo of foretelling the death of the monarch, itself an act of treason, but also with Elizabeth's 1563 Act Against Conjurations, Enchantments and Witchcrafts, which explicitly forbids the conjuring of spirits. The supernatural plays minor roles in a number of Shakespeare's other plays. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, many of the characters are drawn from folklore. Oberon and Titania are king and queen of the fairies. Robin Goodfellow, or Puck, is a mischievous imp or elf creature. Magical herbs and folk magic are used in the play by both human and non-human characters to make deals, brew love potions, and conceal the supernatural events of the play from the humans, making them believe that it was all a dream. In Othello, the titular character is accused of using witchcraft to seduce the daughter, Desdemona, of a Venetian noble. Othello successfully defends himself, arguing that Desdemona fell in love with him because of his tragic life before Venice, rather than any sort of magic. In The Merry Wives of Windsor, the recurring Shakespearean character of John Falstaff attempts to seduce multiple women, the Wives of Windsor, merry or not, at the same time only for them all to be aware of his multitasking, and spending the play tricking and embarrassing him. One of these tricks is by convincing him that he is being attacked by fairies, the main characters in disguise. Fearing for his life because, quote, they are fairies, he that speaks to them shall die, I'll wink and couch, no man their works must I. Falstaff is ordered by the script to lie down on his face. This doesn't quite work, however, and Falstaff is noticed by the fairies. After begging not to be transformed into cheese, Falstaff undertakes a trial by fire to determine whether he is a just or sinful person. Quote, With trial fire touch me his finger end. If he be chaste, the flame will back descend and turn him to no pain. But if he start, it is the flesh of a corrupted heart. Unsurprisingly, Falstaff is burned by the fire, and faces a dance and a song from the fairies when they pinch him and poke him with burning sticks as punishment. The play ends with everyone being happy, though with Falstaff being a good sport and acknowledging that he deserved his treatment. In The Winter's Tale, the character of Paulina is declared to be, quote, mankind witch by the older king of Sicily, Leontes, when Paulina tries to talk him out of ordering the death of his own child, who he believed to have been born by another man. While the child is taken away, the man in charge of killing her cannot go through with it. Before he can do anything else, however, he is famously chased away by a bear, and the baby is found and raised by a shepherd. The grief of losing her daughter causes the queen to die of grief, and Leontes sees the light and vows to atone for his actions. Twenty years later, the child returns, and it's all happy news, except for the fact that the queen is still dead. Well, lo and behold, Paulina had fashioned a statue of the Queen. Paulina announces that she will bring the statue to life, and any who believe this act to be unlawful can leave. Leontes bids her to do it, and Paulina sings to the statue. Leontes claims, if this be magic, let it be an art lawful as eating. More passive acts of magic are dispersed throughout the other plays by the Bard. In King John, the importance of celestial bodies on events on Earth are brought up when one character mentions that five moons had been seen that night, moving around each other in unusual ways, which I have to admit would spook me a little bit too. 
In Julius Caesar, we witness a soothsayer warning Caesar about his doom, and in Hamlet, of course, the hero's father returns as a ghost to demand vengeance for his murder, setting off the plot. In Henry IV, Part I, the characters of Glendower says that, quote, At my nativity, the front of heaven was full of fiery shapes, of burning cressets, and at my birth, the frame and huge foundation of the earth shook like a coward, end quote. Now, I could have spoken that quote with a terrible Welsh accent, because Glendower is, of course, the same Glendower as Owen Glendower, the last Welshman to claim the title of Prince of Wales, and who led a rebellion against the English. Glendower says this about his nativity to Henry Percy, or Henry Hotspur, who is less convinced with his grandstanding. He repeatedly questions how true these omens were, and Glendower gets repeatedly aggravated by his scepticism, going on to expand his claims to blatantly state that he is special. I read this excerpt at the beginning of today's episode. Hotspur is still disinterested, asking if dinner's on the way. Glendower then claims to be able to call spirits, and Hotspur replies that everyone can do that, but they don't always answer. Glendower then says that he can teach Hotspur to summon the devil, and Hotspur counters to say that he can teach Glendower to shame the devil by speaking the truth. So, they're not the closest of friends, then. In The Tempest, the character of Prospero is the exiled Duke of Milan, and an accomplished magician. Unjustly exiled by his brother, Prospero summons the eponymous Tempest to shipwreck his brother and the King of Naples on the island. Magic plays a central role in The Tempest. Multiple characters, both seen and not, are magical in nature. Prospero is obvious, but he is served by a sprite called Ariel, who owes him service because the sorcerer freed him from the curse of Sycorax. Sycorax was a previous inhabitant of the island, a wizened crone who was herself exiled from Algiers for her witchcraft. While dead by the events of the play, her legacy lives on in both the negative descriptions of her in life and her son Caliban, a monstrous half-human who also serves Prospero as a slave as punishment for trying to rape the wizard's daughter, Miranda. The potential fathers of Caliban are variably a demon, a bear, or some sort of fish creature. Prospero himself, after realising that he doesn't actually need revenge, forgives his usurpers and organises a marriage between Miranda and the Prince of Naples, Ferdinand. He goes further, declaring that he will give up his sorcery, breaking his staff and drowning his magical book. First performed in either 1610 or 1611, The Tempest's eponymous storm seems markedly similar to the events during King James's voyage to Denmark two decades previously. While unconfirmed, it is not Shakespeare's only possible attempt to curry favour with the witchcraft-obsessed monarch. Of course, there is Macbeth. One of the greatest Shakespearean tragedies, it depicts a brave Scottish lord twisted by ambition to betray and murder his king, Duncan. When Duncan's sons flee for fear of their own lives, this is taken as guilt of their part in their father's murder, and the crown passes to Macbeth. The guilt of this act drives Macbeth and his wife, Lady Macbeth, to various levels of insanity and paranoia, and they commit further murders to try and keep hold of the crown including Macbeth's best friend Banquo, and the entire household of Macduff, the Thane of Fife, including his wife, children, and servants. Macduff meets with Malcolm, the son and heir of slain Duncan, who is raising an army to take back his kingdom from the progressively more bloodthirsty Macbeth. The army manages to take Dunsinane Castle, the seat of Macbeth, Macbeth is killed by Macduff, and Malcolm sits upon the Scottish throne. That is a substantial summarisation of the play, and only really covering the mundane elements of the story, which are themselves loose interpretations of historical fact. King Duncan, Macbeth himself, Banquo and Malcolm all existed, and to varying degrees were involved in events similar to the play. One of the theories as to why Shakespeare chose this as a topic for a drama, and one that rings true to me, is King James. Macbeth is believed to have been first performed in 1606, three years after James united the crowns of England and Scotland in personal union, and three years since Shakespeare's acting company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men, had become the King's Men through James's patronage. 
Because one of the key prophecies in the play is that of Banquo, Macbeth's friend, would himself not be king, but his descendants would be. This is the fear that causes Macbeth to have him murdered, and so too his son Fleance. Yet, Fleance escapes the murderers and survives the play. No prizes for working out who James claims to be descendant from. Did I forget to mention that there were prophecies? Oh yes, by the way, Macbeth is chock full of the supernatural. Ghosts, visions, prophecies and omens, and of course, witches. After having Banquo murdered, his ghost appears to Macbeth at a feast, only visible to him, and causing him to make a bit of a scene in front of his guests. When trying to work himself up to betray and murder Duncan, Macbeth makes his famous Is this a dagger which I see before me? soliloquy. Lady Macbeth, even more ambitious than her husband, calls on evil spirits to, quote, unsex her, because her very femininity, with its penchant for kindness and maternal instincts, would get in the way. There is a lot, and I mean a lot, of literary debate over this act. She demands to be filled with, quote, direst cruelty, end quote, to have her breast milk turn to bile, to make her blood run thick, for her to not feel any regret for her actions, and calling on hell itself to hide her evil. Later in the play, guilt causes her to endlessly rub and wash her own hands, forever seeing them covered in the blood of her crimes, and she eventually takes her own life in the build-up to the final battle. So now we come to the witches. The highlight of the highlight of this episode, and the reason I've devoted an entire episode, and four and a half thousand words and counting, to the works of Shakespeare. Think back to Middleton's The Witch, which we covered last time. I made the point that the witches are largely passive. They provide services in the manner of any shopkeeper, chemist, or doctor, never judging or motivating the characters to commit their deeds. The three sisters of Macbeth are somewhat similar, and in some ways are less to blame for the actions of others than those of the ones in The Witch. All the witches do is tell the future. Well, aside from being otherwise evil and reveling in it, of course. The first scene of the play is of three sisters, speaking in circles, and otherwise being unnerving. They leave to meet with their familiars, a concept well known to Jacobean audiences, and leave with the infamous, fair is foul, and foul is fair. This sets the tone of the entire play. The witches, in Jacobean society, and in the play, stand for inversion. Their existence and their deeds flip the established order of things. If you recall the episodes on the North Berwick trials under James, the coven of witches recounts how they held their gatherings in abandoned churches, deliberately conducting their rituals in the opposite manner of good Christians. The next time we meet the witches is in the third scene, and we see more examples of their everyday evil. One which has been, quote, killing swine, end quote. The assumption is that this is for nefarious purposes, as a sacrifice or for ingredients. Another witch is complaining that a sailor's wife was eating chestnuts and gave none to her. So to avenge this slight, she plans to have the husband's ship sink in a storm, which is, I'm sure you agree, perfectly justifiable. I read her curse at the beginning of today's episode, and again this is more than likely written in the knowledge of James's own brush with a witchcraft-induced storm. Also familiar to English audiences would be the concept of magical retribution for refusing the requests of a witch. Remembering back to the episode on English witch beliefs, commonly the events leading to an accusation of witchcraft began with a neighbour refusing another the use of tools or the giving of food, with subsequent misfortune being laid at the feet of the spurned neighbour. The idea of a witch causing the death of not just the woman's husband, but also the rest of the crew, all over some chestnuts, would not be unbelievable. Macbeth and Banquo then arrive, and Macbeth's first line in the entire play, the play that bears his name, So foul and fair a day I have not seen. Now, even sleeping through English literature, I could see that parallel. Banquo almost immediately notices the three sisters, and we get the first description of them. What are these, so withered and so wild in their attire, that look not like the inhabitants of the earth, and yet are on it? Live you? Or are you aught that man may question? You seem to understand me. By each at once her chappy finger laying upon her skinny lips, you should be women. 
and yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. So, the witches look unearthly, possibly not alive, and appear to be women, but have beards, so even that is questioned. The witches then hail Macbeth as first Thane of Glams, then Thane of Cordell, and king hereafter. He is already Thane of Glams, and does not yet know that he has been declared Thane of Cordell, so at first these ramblings seem ridiculous. Banquo then asks for his future, where he is told that he will not be king, but his descendants shall be. The witches vanish, ignoring Macbeth's calls for clarification, and Macbeth's newfound title of Cordor is announced shortly after by arriving characters. Macbeth writes to his wife to tell her the witch's prophecy, and the two of them are driven by ambition to murder Duncan, who is conveniently visiting their keep. The witches next appear in the scene following the feast, which is gatecrashed by the ghost of Banquo. Here, they are reprimanded by Hecat for overstepping their bounds. We last saw Hecate in the last episode as the leader of the witches in Middleton's Witch, but prior to that we knew her as the Greek goddess of crossroads and witches. Hecate is angry that the witches did not get her involved with Macbeth, and shows her anger by singing a song. Last time I mentioned that this song is held up as evidence of collaboration between Middleton and Shakespeare, as the song, Come Away, Come Away, appears in both the witch and in one of the versions of Macbeth. The appearance of Hecate in both plays has also been used to argue that this scene was inserted whole cloth by Middleton after Shakespeare's death. One claim I found is that Middleton went so far as to rewrite the appearance of the witches themselves. An account by Simon Foreman of a performance of the play in 1611 describes the witches as fairies or nymphs, a far cry from their current form, which is much closer to Middleton's witches. When the witches next appear, they are surrounding a boiling cauldron, chanting. In this cauldron they put, among other things, poisoned entrails, toads, eye of newt, toe of frog, wool of bat, tongue of dog, adder's fork, and blind worm's sting, lizard's leg, and owlet's wing. I could go on, it, it is quite fun. The point is, again, inversion. A Jacobean audience would often have their food cooked in cauldrons and pots. This was normal, mundane, it was a comfortable item. They would not, however, cook the body parts of Jews, Tartars, and Turks, or eat the tongues of dogs or the blood of a baboon. The witches are putting foreign, the unusual, into something normal. Each witch takes her turn to list a number of bizarre and disgusting items, and interspersed with one of the most famous lines in all of fiction. Double double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. After a few choruses of this, Hecate arrives in a much happier mood, commending the witches for their efforts and, again, singing them a song, this time called Black Spirits, before disappearing. One of the witches then announces, by the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes, and Macbeth enters the stage demanding answers. Asking what they are doing, they reply as one, a deed without a name which is suitably ominous, I'm sure you'll agree. He orders the witches to tell him what he wants to know, and they ask if he would, quote, rather hear it from our mouths or from our masters, to which Macbeth says to call their masters. The witches make another spell, throwing sow's blood and the grease from the gibbet of a murderer into the fire, and summoning three apparitions. Macbeth begins to ask his question, but is told, essentially, shut up, they can hear your thoughts. The first spirit is a decapitated head that tells him to beware Macduff before disappearing. The second takes the form of a bloody child who tells him that no man of woman born can harm Macbeth. Well, that sounds good to Macbeth since everyone has a mother. The third spirit appears as a child wearing a crown and holding a tree who tells Macbeth that until Great Burnham Wood advances against Dunsinane Castle, he will never be defeated. This sounds even better to Macbeth, since we all know that trees can't move. The witches then conjure a line of eight kings, accompanied by the ghost of Banquo, and the bright glory of their crowns hurts Macbeth's eyes. The final figure holds a mirror, which reflects the line of kings back again, each of them holding multiple Ragnar scepters and orbs. Banquo's ghost then points at them and smiles. 
Again, no prizes for guessing what dynasty of kings, holding multiple crowns, descended from Banquo, and whose progeny currently sat on the throne of England Shakespeare was trying to flatter there. The witches then dance and disappear, not being seen by the men who rush on stage at Macbeth's call. While Macbeth takes comfort from the prophecies which seem to declare his invincibility, but of course, they foretell his doom. In the words of Tyrion Lannister in A Dance of Dragons, Prophecy is like a half-trained mule. It looks as though it might be useful, but the moment you trust in it, it kicks you in the head. And so it happens here. Macbeth, trusting in the witch's words, has no fear when he hears that Malcolm, son of Duncan, is marching to dethrone him. It is soon revealed, however, that the prophecies have well and truly kicked him in the head. The advancing army cuts branches from the trees of Great Burnham Wood, holding them in front of themselves to hide their numbers. Where was Macbeth holding up? Oh yes, Dunsinane Castle. So the Great Burnham Wood was now advancing against Dunsinane Hill. Shaken, but undisturbed, Macbeth faces Macduff in a duel, mocking him for believing he can kill him. Macduff then declares, in the face of Macbeth's faith in his prophecies, that he is not born of woman, having been born via Caesarean section. Shock and or horror, Macbeth accepts that he's been tricked, refuses to surrender, preferring to go down fighting. So, the supernatural in Macbeth is fairly prominent, and like I said, the witches don't lie to Macbeth, but they flatter him and tell him the truth in a way that leads to his damnation by murdering Duncan and Banquo, and then to overconfidence in the face of the rebellion. The depiction of the weird sisters as hideous people dealing in evil magic is perfectly in line with Elizabethan and Jacobean witch beliefs, as are the motives for their spiteful curses and their relationship with their familiars. It's also important to remember the preferences of King James. It is just over a decade since his stormy encounter en route to Scandinavia, and only a few years after the publication of his demonology. Shakespeare's company was the King's Men, and it would make perfect sense, both financial and social, to appeal to the King's fascination with the occult. Yet, the prevalence of the supernatural in the plays performed prior to James' accession suggests that magic was an audience pleaser. Either as another mark against the bizarre, in English minds at least, life of Joan of Arc, or as a reference for real-life events such as the conviction of Eleanor, Duchess of Gloucester, for witchcraft. Thank you to Witchfinder General Michelle G and the Inquisitors Trish G, Elaine D, and the aptly named Executed Today, and all of my theologians for supporting the show through Patreon. You can join their ranks by visiting the show's Patreon page at patreon.com slash historyofwitchcraft. It helps motivate me no end. If, after this episode, you still have a craving for my voice, then I have a treat for you. Go listen to the latest 80 Days podcast, Runnymede 1216, where I bring forth the character of King John of England, which may just compete with Paul Giamatti and Ironclad. I am a lot less shouty, though. If you've enjoyed the episode, please consider leaving me a positive review on iTunes, Stitcher, or whichever podcast app you use. You can visit the website at thehistoryofwitchcraft.co.uk, where you will find my contact details if you have any questions. The show also has a Facebook page and a Twitter feed if you want to keep up to date. The intro and outro music have been provided by Sounds Like an Earful. Thank you again for listening.